All right. Thanks, Pam. Um, thank you guys all for being here. I'm excited to talk to you about spotted skunks. Um, first thing I wanted to ask you all, though, so before seeing this flyer and everything, how many of you guys knew that there was another species of skunk other than the striped skunk? OK, most of you. That's good. Um, so how many of you have ever actually seen a spotted skunk then? That's more than I was expecting, honestly. Um, so this species is actually pretty widespread historically throughout the United States, um, but it's just really poorly understood. And in a lot of places where they exist, people just won't even know it. Um, and so that's why it's been really exciting to work on them, because we just have so many knowledge gaps that everything we're finding out is pretty much new. Um, so to jump right into it then, an eastern spotted skunk are these little stripy spotted guys. They are a skunk, so they still have a really noxious smelling spray, and they're black and white, but they're very distinguishable from the more common striped skunk. Um, so rather than the two stripes that run the length of their back, they have four stripes that are kind of broken towards their rear end to resemble spots. Um, they're also much smaller than striped skunks. They're only about the size of a squirrel. They generally range from half a pound to less than two pounds. Um, and then they're also characterized by this um, bushy white tipped tail. And you can see it really well in this drawing, but also in the pictures. Um, and it's just kind of the tip of their tail, get these long white furs. Um, one other thing about spotted skunks, which I'm going to hop over here to start a link, um, is that they're known for this very defensive, um, very interesting handstand gesture. Um, and hopefully I'm not in anyone's way here, where, yeah, they pop up on their front legs when they're threatened, oh no, um, and dance around like this to try and deter any predators, yeah. So, um, very characteristic, very adorable. Um, and I will close this real quick to stop the autoplay. Great. Um, so. That is the spotted skunk. Um, they're pretty cute, but like I said, we really don't know very much about them. Um, there are actually two species of spotted skunks in the United States. There's the western spotted skunk in this gray here to the left of the red line, and then there are three species of east, subspecies, excuse me, of eastern spotted skunks. So the plain spotted skunk is in these hashed, this hashed area here, um, and that's, uh, as the name suggests, in the Great Plains region of the United States. And then we have the Florida spotted skunk just down here in the panhandle of Florida, which very interestingly, they actually seem to be much more abundant down there. Um, a lot of people report them in their yards or um, sometimes in their like, laundry vents, which is interesting because they seem pretty rare throughout the rest of their range. But then what, where we are, we have the Appalachian spotted skunk. Um, and as the name suggests, it ranges through most of the Appalachians. Um, including where we are uh, today. So one of the reasons people are uh, really interested in spotted skunks is that in the 1900s, their population went, underwent a really dramatic decline. Um, and so in this figure, what it's showing is that um, over time, so from 1925 to about the to 1990, um, on the bars on the bottom, is pelt price, so demand for eastern spotted skunk pelts. And these descending lines are harvest records um, from fur bearing records. Um, and so you can see that even though demand kind of stays the same and even increases a little bit here towards the end of the century, uh, this decline does seem to be real. It's not just a matter of um, lack of effort. Um, despite this, we don't really know what might have caused this decline. There are three leading theories. The first is that disease outbreak may have had a um, really strong negative effect on spotted skunk populations. Um, it's thought that over harvest from trapping may have contributed to this, although there's a lot of evidence saying that it probably wouldn't have driven the decline this dramatically. Um, but probably the most um, popular theory is that it was the um, change from homestead farms to large scale agriculture that really eliminated a lot of the complexity on the landscape um, and a lot of the little habitat patches that spotted skunks were using. Um, so despite this decline, uh, the conservation status of eastern spotted skunks is uh, variable. Federally, it is not listed at all, although the plain subspecies has been peti petitioned to be listed under the Endangered Species Act. Uh, the verdict is not in on this yet. 
Um, but the International Union for the Conservation of Nature has recently upgraded spotted skunks to a uh, listing of vulnerable. Um, and so that's definitely a start. Um, state to state conservation status does vary. A lot of states, including North and South Carolina, still have open seasons on spotted skunks. Um, however, in South Carolina, it's considered a species of moderate conservation priority, and it is significantly rare, considered significantly rare in North Carolina, and is a priority species for more research. Um, so some basic ecology of spotted skunks. They are very nocturnal. Um, so while you may see striped skunks around at dawn and dusk, um, you're not as likely to see a spotted skunk out. All of our pictures, it's dead of night when we get detections of spotted skunks. Um, their home ranges do vary seasonally. The females tend to have smaller home ranges, about a half a square kilometer, whereas the males get um, a little larger to about one and a half square kilometers on average. They're solitary species, aside from when they're mating or uh, females that have kits, they tend to be very solitary. Um, and they do mate in the spring, so you'll see, uh, male home ranges will increase in this time as they go look for uh, females to mate with. Their diet is not super well understood. We ha there hasn't been any studies of spotted skunk diet since the 1940s, um, but they do appear to be very opportunistic. They'll eat insects, amphibians, and small mammals especially. Um, they have low rest site fidelity, and so from night to night, they may not use the same uh, site, so it's not like they have a home den or anything where they keep coming back to. Um, and so especially if you see a spotted skunk in your yard or something and then it's not there for a long time, um, it is likely that it's just moved on to another part of its home range. Um, they're very dexterous. They're actually very capable of climbing trees. And so this is a female that we collared for my research. And when we let her go, rather than running into a hole or into some shrubs, she ran straight up this tree, which was pretty interesting. Um, and they do like to have a dense understory cover that'll provide them protection from predators, especially from owls, which is their main predator. Um, otherwise, we do have a lot of knowledge gaps about spotted skunks still. Um, one of the biggest ones is that we don't really know what their current demographic trends are. So we don't know if overall the population is increasing or de decreasing or if it's stable. Um, and so that's a big thing that we're still working to figure out. Um, so throughout their range, they do have a really large, ra large range. They're known to occupy a variety of habitat types. Um, most of it is associated with understory cover, so uh, young uh, pine stands that still have lots of little trees in the understory, um, high, uh, high elevation spruce forests, excuse me, in Virginia um, down here, and then some um, deciduous forests, and then weirdly in Florida, again, they're kind of doing their own thing down there, they'll use uh, dry prairie or coastal scrub land. Um, but from here on, I'm gonna focus on the Southern Appalachian hardwood forests, which is where we are now. Um, and this map here just shows hardwood deciduous forests uh, approximately in the Eastern United States. And so you can see that um, right here in Western North Carolina, Georgia, and a little bit of South Carolina, we have this patch of hardwood forest in the Southern Appalachians, where around that it's a lot of pine forests and mixed forests. Um, but we focused, uh, for my research, on this area of Southern Appalachian hardwood forests. And as I'm sure a lot of you know, it's an extremely diverse area. It was never glaciated, um, and it's very fragmented by a lot of uh, drainage channels. Um, and I do want to talk about this for a second, because I'll use the term drainage channel a lot uh, going forward. And when I talk about that, I mean not only the streams that have flowing water in them, but also a lot of the minor landforms where runoff will go. Maybe it only has uh, flowing water during active rain events. Um, but these features do really shape a lot of the vegetation and the topography of the landscape. And so going forward, I did look at drainage channels, including all those little features. Um, just wanted to make sure that was clear before I go crazy talking about it. Um, all right, and then the, um, in this region, in the Southern Appalachian hardwood region, spotted skunks have uh, only just recently been studied. The very first study of them was by a Clemson Creative Inquiry class, so a class of undergraduates who rediscovered the species in, um, in South Carolina. And it was the first reported detections of spotted skunks in South Carolina in 17 years, 
Um, so that was pretty exciting. Some people had thought the species was actually locally extinct, but it turns out they weren't, and that's great. Um, so for my research, I did two studies of eastern spotted skunk habitat selection. Uh, the first thing I'll talk about is our study, which was to monitor um, occurrence at the landscape scale. And we had two objectives for this. So when evaluating, um, when studying carnivores, and especially mammals, sometimes it's very difficult to detect them. And so the first thing we wanted to do was assess how likely we were to detect a spotted skunk if it's present. Um, because generally we assume that there's imperfect detection, but by evaluating what increases detection probability, we can, one, inform future studies how to better um, monitor for the species, and two, we can evaluate if we may be underestimating occurrence because there are species, individuals there that we're not picking up in our monitoring efforts. Um, the second objective of this study was to evaluate what factors um, influence the probability of occurrence on the landscape overall. So what habitat attributes at the landscape scale are spotted skunks selecting for. Um, and so this is just a picture of the landscape in the Southern Appalachians. Um, so for this study, we did a non-invasive camera monitoring pro uh, project. We used Bushnell game cameras, and they were set so that any time an animal was in front of them, they would take one photo every three seconds. Um, mostly this worked really well. Sometimes we would get thousands of pictures of leaves in the wind, which was a shame, but you know, that's, you, you get used to it. Um, this study occurred in North and South Carolina. We originally had a much larger study area, but we had some issues with our camera functioning. Um, between our collaborators, and so we ended up only using um, a subset of the sites in North and Ca South Carolina. All of our sites were baited with a can of sardines nailed to a tree, and we also used scent lure treatments, which um, are these three treatments. We had, whoop, nope, um, cherry oil, uh, gusto, and, con and a control. So the cherry oil is a super sweet smelling um, scent lure, kind of smells like Twizzlers, um, but really, really strongly. The gusto smells a lot like skunks. It's actually made of several different animal musks. It's really stinky, but it's a very common carnivore lure, so we thought we would try that for spotted skunks. And then we had a control, which was no additional lure, just to see if they were making a difference at all. Um, our sites were visited every two weeks, and so this is a group of my undergraduates. I had about 18 under, undergraduates help me with this project and collecting data. And it did require a lot of hiking off trail into the mountains, which was a lot of fun and I think really good experience for them. Um, and so originally, like I said, we had a really large study area um, through most of Western North Carolina, some of Georgia, and then uh, this uh, Northwest corner of South Carolina, which we were hoping to monitor. But um, we ended up only using the sites in this subset region where uh, we actually collected the data out of Clemson. Um, we had very different detection rates between our three different collaborators, and we couldn't really be sure if that was actually due to skunk presence or if it was just a different way we were setting our cameras up. Um, and so it did limit our sample size, but there is ongoing research in Western North Carolina, and they're doing more cameras so that hopefully they'll be able to publish their own thing uh, just in a couple years here. So these are the sites we actually did. The black sites were monitored in 2017, and the white dots were monitored in 2016. Um, as I said, we were on three different national forests, um, and Georgia is there, yeah. <laughs> um, so this is our general array for doing this monitoring. Um, we had our camera tree and a bait tree that were approximately two to five meters apart, and the bait was affixed, nailed to the tree about a meter up, um, and so, in real life, it looks something like this. Um, and so you can see here is the camera tree, and over here, this is um, Christian putting a can of sardines on that tree. And then we also collected a lot of vegetation data whenever we were at these sites. Um, and so we collected understory cover and coarse woody debris in the field at the site. And we also collected data on how high the camera was from the ground, high, high, how high, excuse me, the bait was from the ground and the distance between the camera and the bait tree, a uh, thing that this might influence how likely we were to detect a spotted skunk. Um, 
We also collected, uh, used a lot of data that we collected in the lab using GIS, um, such as slope and aspect, canopy cover, and distance to the nearest drainage channel. So we had a few hypotheses. We had separate hypotheses for what we thought would influence detection probability as what we thought would influence uh, the probability of incur occurrence. Um, for detection probability, we thought that we'd be more likely to detect spotted skunks in areas where there was lower predation risk. Um, and so areas with more understory cover or more coarse woody debris. Um, we also, as I said, thought our camera setup might influence um, how likely we were to detect a spotted skunk. So for instance, we predicted that a greater distance from the camera to the bait would inf increase our likelihood of detecting a skunk because we'd have a wider frame of view um, that our camera is uh, capturing pictures of. Um, and also our scent lures we thought might influence. That was a little bit of an experimental twist we threw in to see if the scent lures had an impact. Um, for occurrence, we had a couple separate hypotheses. We thought that, again, predation risk would influence spotted skunks. Um, we thought that thermoregulation, because we were monitoring in the winter, we thought spotted skunks might prefer sites on south-facing slopes where it's warmer so they could not be uh, as stressed thermoregulatively. Thermoregulati um, and we also thought that an abundance of drainage channels in an area might connect the area and facilitate their movement. Um, and might be preferred for that reason because they can more easily get around to different patches and they don't straight up and down a lot of really exposed slopes. So some descriptive results first. Um, of all of those sites, we had detection at 25 of our 45 sites. So we had just over, um, I think we had a 55% occurrence rate, which was pretty good, definitely more than we thought we were going to get. Um, but interestingly, our detection rate was much lower. So of all of the, I think we had 254 two-week check periods, and only 18% of those actually had a detection of a spotted skunk. Um, I broke that down a little further to look at nightly detection. So for each camera um, and each night, how frequently did we detect spotted skunks? And only 3% of the active trap nights actually had detections of spotted skunks. So while they did seem pretty broadly distributed spatially, um, we really had very few detections and general, just very few photos of spotted skunks overall. Um, and so results of our analysis found that this distance between the bait and the camera did show the relationship we expected and had a positive effect on detection probability. We also found that coarse woody debris, um, spotted skunks did like sites with more coarse woody debris and they were more likely to be detected there. Um, our scent lures, we had some uncertainty here, so they weren't um, highly significant results, but we did observe a trend that spotted skunks seemed to prefer sites um, that were baited with the cherry lure, whereas sites baited with the gusto lure, they actually seemed um, potentially to avoid them. Um, we had fewer s detections at gusto sites than at cherry or our control sites. However, I said these weren't uh, significant, so we would need a little more research to make some hard claims there. Um, overall, although we did find these relationships, our covariates were just poor predictors of detection. So um, this really suggests that there's probably some other things going on that we didn't measure um, that may have been influencing detection rate. I know another study has found uh, moon illumination. So nights with a full moon, spotted skunks are less detectable because they are um, probably more exposed to predation. Um, and then in terms of occupancy probability, we found that spotted skunks were actually um, more likely to occupy sites at lower elevations. And this was opposite of what we had actually predicted. Um, but very interesting, and I'll talk in a little bit about kind of what we think was driving that. Um, again, we had a trend that spotted skunks may have preferred sites with steeper slopes. However, uh, we had a lot of uncertainty with this too, so we would need a little more data and a little more time to figure out if that's a real, a real trend that is influencing occupancy. Um, all right, and so just talk about a little of what we found for this project. Um, so overall, we did have pretty high occupancy rates throughout this region that we studied, um, but we had these low detection rates. And this kind of suggests that spotted skunks 
might not be as rare on the landscape and instead might just be very difficult to come across, very difficult to detect. Um, and I think that going forward, there's a few things that research projects and people could do to increase detection probability. Um, one, I think using multiple cameras could be very helpful. So if a spotted skunk was attracted to a site based on the lure but didn't actually come right up to the can of sardines, um, it might have been there, but we missed the detection of it. So using multiple cameras at a site could really improve detection probability. Additionally, um, when I worked on carnivores out west, we used chicken, just nailed to a tree. Um, and it, uh, we got a lot of western spotted skunks that way because they could actually get a caloric reward. They could get real food instead of just looking at some juices of sardines. So I think that that could also really increase our detection probability by giving them a real reward for coming to our site. Um, elevation, like I said, was our primary factor that seemed to be influencing occurrence. Um, and our thought was that this is probably associated with different forest types that are driven by elevation. So as many of you may know, um, the Southern Appalachians are just a mosaic of different forest types. So you'll have um, northern hardwoods on the higher elevations, and you'll have the mesic oak pine forests on the really hot, dry slopes. And then in the low elevations, you'll have a lot of um, cove forests. And so it could be that what we're finding with elevation here is really, this is just uh, representing a difference in vegetation and forest that spotted skunks are preferring. Um, it would require some further fine scale studies to really tease that apart. Um, but it, this is not really what we expected to find. So it was a really interesting um, result here. Similarly, it could be that elevation, the Sorry, <laughs> it could be that spotted skunk's uh, preference for lower elevations could be reflecting a preference for areas near drainages uh, and near streams that are, have more moisture and maybe have more food or something like that. Um, there's a lot we could still learn going forward. I think that especially doing a landscape scale study, um, looking at the different scale by which we um, think about our different attributes that we measure, our different habitat covariates, um, could really maybe tease apart some more of the relationships here. So for this study, um, we averaged slope and elevation across a like 1.77 kilometer squared circle around the site, because we didn't want to just measure the area at the site, because we didn't think that was representative of the whole landscape. Um, however, using such a large area, we might have washed out any real differences that spotted skunks were um, assuming. So if you think about um, the slope, you know, at one spot, a slope is facing one direction. But within a whole area, you're going to have slopes facing all directions. And we may have washed out um, some resolution there. Also, um, studies that will cover a larger area, like we had initially intended to do, could be really illuminating, especially if they were able to get areas outside of the mountains or nearer to human development to see if there are thresholds for where spotted skunks are likely to occur. Um, another really exciting opportunity, I think, would be to try and identify spotted skunks by their spot patterns individually. And this would allow us to get abundance estimates, which really gets at that big uh, knowledge gap we have about demographic trends of spotted skunks. Um, right, and finally, I didn't really evaluate how spotted skunks were responding to management practices, but I think this is another important avenue of research going forward. All right, and so now we're on to the second objective here. Uh, this one was a little more fun because I got to go chase spotted skunks through the woods. Um, and we evaluated rest site habitat selection. And so we were looking at what attributes of habitat might predict um, spotted skunk rest site use. And so, like I said, we collared skunks and then chased them through the woods using telemetry. And we've located the exact rest sites they used. So in this picture, we've got a little spotted skunk in that tree. And this was my favorite skunk because he would always poke his face out at me and be like, what are you doing? I'm like, oh, I'm just, just looking for you. Um, so we trapped spotted skunks um, for four months in the spring, uh, the winter and spring of both 2016 and 2017. We used tomahawk wire tra live traps. So this is a tomahawk trap. And we fit them with these little uh, plastic cubbies, which were great because they served a lot of purposes. So for one, they protected the spotted skunk if it was trapped early in the night. 
um, from the weather or potentially like a raccoon or something that also came to the site. It gives them a little protection there. Um, also then the next morning when we show up, it prevents the skunk from spraying us immediately. Um, <laughs> really great. Um, so, uh, and you can see here the back opens up and so we can like go and check and see what's in there and it helps us get them out the front when we need to. Um, and then when we actually handle them, we fit them with 16 gram um, transmitters and just like a little collar. Um, and we use a canvas handling cone, which you can kind of see it's this black fabric here. And the way that works is you run the skunk into it um, from the opening of the trap into this cone and it's cut like a triangle. It kind of looks like an icing piper that you'll see people decorate cakes with, but there's a skunk in it. Um, and uh, so they run in so that their little nose is up at the point and then there's Velcro down the side so you can just open it enough that their head will pop through and you can fit a collar on them without them kicking and scratching and spraying. Um, that was a really great technique because the only time we were in super danger of getting sprayed between the box and the handling cone was when we had to check their gender. And what are you going to do then? You're just going <laughs> to risk it. Um, a couple times, yeah. Not, not as often as you might think, given that I was like out here looking for them. But, you know, sometimes you can they're not super happy with us. Um, <laughs> yeah, her dogs were, though. <laughs> Um, and so one other thing that was just really interesting is spotted skunks, for whatever reason, really like to pull a lot of dirt into the trap when they get caught. And so you can always tell when you have a spotted skunk in the trap because you'll go and look in the front and just see a big pile of leaves and debris and they just make themselves like a nice little nest in the back and like, you know, a lot of times I sh if you show up really quietly, you'll peek in and they'll just be like sleeping in the back there like, oh, leave me alone. Um, all right, so once we have them fit with collars, we, oh, these are the collars we put on them. Um, so they're pretty small. Um, so once we have them fit with these collars, we're then able to track the skunks throughout the summer. And so it's April to August, both years. Um, and we use very high frequency telemetry for this. Um, so using a receiver like this and a directional antenna, which is what uh, Zoe has here, um, we're able to locate the direction of the spotted skunk and as we get closer we can refine and refine until we can find the actual site where the skunk is. Um, and so it's a lot of fun, it's a little frustrating sometimes, um, but we located rest sites as frequently as we could and then once we were there we also collected vegetation data around the habitat. Um, and so we collected again a measure of coarse woody debris, we got estimates of ground cover, understory cover, and canopy cover at each site. Um, and we also got a count of how many woody stems there were in the area. Um, and then again, we used GIS to get some other dis uh, data about the sites, um, the slope, the aspect, the distance to the nearest drainage, and the canopy type. Um, and so for our analysis, every time we found a rest site where a skunk was, we also measured these vegetation characteristics for a paired site that was available to the skunk but not used. Um, and we did this so that when we ran our analysis, we could really look at what was being selected for instead of just what was um, at the sites themselves. And so this way, yeah, we were able to compare between what's available on the landscape and what's actually being selected. Um, so we had hypotheses again, and this time for rest site selection, we hypothesi hypothesized that Spotted skunks would prefer sites where abundant prey. Um, makes sense, so that they could eat more easily and not have to run all over the place to find food. Um, because this was the summer, we again had thermal regulation, but we kind of flip-flopped our hypothesis here to think that they would prefer, prefer north-facing slopes and deciduous cover that produces really deep shade that'll keep them cooler in the summer, especially during the day when they're trying to rest and uh, don't want to be super hot. Um, and then we also predicted that spotted skunks would select sites that reduce predation risk. And so this was ground co cover, understory cover, canopy cover. Also, we thought slope and the woody stems would reduce maneuverability of um, terrestrial predators. So if it's really steep and there's a lot of rhododendron stems, a coyote is not going to be able to weave through it as well as a spotted skunk is who's running away. Oh, I'm missing some pictures here. Oh, well. So, rest sites. These are some examples of rest sites. 
Uh, there were two more, but they got clipped off. Um, but you can see that they use sites up in tree cavities above ground. Uh, we had a lot of sites in root cavities, so in snags and live trees, um, a lot of times in root mounds of fallen trees, um, and you know everything in between decaying trees or partially fallen over trees. And then we also had some sites that were just in ground burrows that looked like they'd been excavated by other small mammals or sometimes possibly by the spotted skunks themselves. Overall, we were able to trap 28 spotted skunks. We had 20 males and eight females, so a pretty uh, strong sex skew there. Um, unfortunately, owing to some issues with collar fitting and the clasps of the collars breaking open, excuse me, we were only able to track 15 of them for our study. So we ended up with 10 males and five females for our uh, study that we did here. Um, and over the course of these two years, we were able to um, track spotted skunks on 233 occasions. And this was 205 unique sites. Um, so about 12% of the time when we found a spotted skunk, it was in a site that it had used previously. Um, and so to look at this data another way, um, these polygons and colors here show the different individuals we had. Um, and so by drawing polygons around them, we can get approximate home range sizes of the spotted skunks. And you can see, uh, similar to what's been reported before, females averaged about um, a half a kilometer squared, and so this was a female here. Um, there's a female in yellow back here. It all kind of got overlapped on itself. And this one here was a female in red. Um, the males had larger home ranges, typically. Um, we did have this guy who was an outlier, uh, and his home range was, I think, it, over two times the size of anyone else's. Uh, what we think happened is we probably caught oh, the end of his mating movements in some of our first locations, um, probably these ones down here, because after um, you know early May, he moved back up here and never came back. So uh, that's kind of what we expect for that. Um, and if we took this 4.4 out of this average here, the average home range for males was about a square kilometer. Um, so as far as the rest site structures used, we generally broke them into these five categories, hollow logs, ground cavities, rocky outcrops, root cavities, or tree cavities. Um, the, major the majority of our sites, most of the sites were in root cavities, 40% of them, um, followed by tree cavities, and then ground cavities and hollow logs. Um, this was interesting because uh, most of our sites overall, if you consider hollow logs, root cavities, and tree cavities, tree associates. Uh, most of our sites were associated with trees, which is very different with, with what's been reported in other parts of the spotted skunks range. Um, other areas uh, report a lot of use of rocky outcrops. However, um, our study area just didn't really have any. So we had, I think, one rocky outcrop and two sites that we found. So it just kind of shows that they do seem to be pretty opportunistic. It might just be more what's available um, and then the surrounding habitat that's really influencing where they rest. Um, so this figure just shows um, which of those covariates actually came out as important in our analysis. Um, and so we had three variables that were the most important. Dr distance to drainage had a negative association, and this is what we would expect. So the closer you are to um, a drainage, the more likely a spotted skunk is to select it for a rest site. Um, and then coarse woody debris again came out as important, and then understory cover also came out as important. Um, and so these were all what we expected. Uh, coarse woody debris and understory cover had positive associations, so the more woody debris or understory cover, the more um, likely a skunk was to use it for a rest site. Um, and so these variables related to our predator avoidance and our prey availability hypotheses. Um, for understory cover, this, I think I said it in one of the first slides, this has actually been really frequently reported as one of the most important factors for spotted skunk habitat selection. Um, it does seem that it kind of they're not picky in what's making that understory cover. If it's uh, scrub, coastal scrub in Florida, or if it's little pine saplings in um, the Wachita Mountains, um, or if it's a lot of under uh, mountain laurel and rhododendron, they just need that understory cover. Um, and again, largely because owls do appear to be their primary predator. Um, coarse woody debris and drainage channels came out as important for us and 
These haven't come out as important uh, factors for spotted skunks in other parts of their um, range. Um, nobody else has looked at drainage channels the way we did, so uh, we were pretty excited that that came out as, I think, our most important factor. And while we considered it in regards to prey availability, we think there's a lot of different things that this could be actually helping spotted skunks. So for movement is corridors through the habitat, especially because these uh, channels tend to have higher moisture content. They might also be associated with more understory cover. Um, and then also where they converge, it could be a really good, where drainages converge, could be a really good space for um, animals to communicate with you know, scent marking and things. And so we think that this uh, could be just a really important factor overall for wildlife, but especially for spotted skunks. And then similarly, while coarse woody debris almost certainly provides a good spot to forage for prey, um, it, we also found it was used pretty frequently as a rest site structure. Um, and so it could be serving multiple purposes here, and especially because prey does seem to change seasonally um, based on what's available, woody debris could be really important because it's associated with um, invertebrates and with small mammals and sometimes with um, amphibians, which kind of covers the whole year of different prey sources. Um, so one other thing, oh, this is a really cute video, it's on loop, don't worry. Um, uh, another really important thing that I think needs to be studied, we didn't really have enough females to get at this very much, um, but what are females who are raising kits uh, really selecting for. Um, den sites, which is you know females where females raise their kits, are really important to a lot of species because um, when they give birth and in those first couple weeks of a kit's life, they're extremely vulnerable. And so if you have a site that isn't very stable or that predators can get into, those, um, those babies really have no way to defend themselves. And so um, knowing more about the sites that females use for denning uh, could really help us with management um, to know like what we need to save specifically and what we need to conserve specifically. And also, um, this could relate pretty directly to increased kit survival and uh, move up through uh, population demographic trends. Um, and so that's the summary of what I worked on, but there is more research going on right now about spotted skunks. There's a PhD student at Clemson who is working in North Carolina, in southwestern North Carolina studying spotted skunks, and the Wildlife Resource Commission in North Carolina is still monitor monitoring throughout Western North Carolina. Um, and so with that, uh, a lot of people I need to thank because I um, couldn't have done this without them, with my advisor, my technicians, uh, my lab mates, and my graduate student cohort, and then of course, all the people I collaborated with and my funding sources, um, very important. Um, cool. And then with that, oh wait, there's one more. Nope. Right, and so one more. If you guys have seen an Eastern Spotted Skunk recently or any time, um, or if you do going forward, um, they are still studying Spotted Skunks. And so this is the contact for Casey. She works with the North Carolina Wildlife Resource Commission. And she said if anyone ever sees a Spotted Skunk, they would really love if you could uh, contact her. Um, and let her know, specifically if you have a picture or some way to really prove it's a spotted skunk, um, just, just to make sure. But 